All right, good morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Sorry, it's standing room only. <laughs> um, so I'm John Nelson. I'm the water and cropping systems extension educator here in Lancaster County. And I also cover Cass and Odo County. Um, so I started in April of this year. I'm part of the wave of new water and cropping systems educator hires. I think we've hired seven this year across the state. So pretty cool for extension to have a lot of those positions filled that haven't been filled in a while. Um, so for some of you who aren't familiar with this program, Tyler Williams, my predecessor, uh, started this probably in 2015, maybe. Did it for several years. And when I first started here, I talked to several people who really liked the program and um, suggested that we bring it back. So this is our this is our first attempt at. Uh, restarting a good program that had done really well in the past. So I'd like to acknowledge the folks who helped me with this. Tyler pulled it off on his own, but I looked out for help. So Nathan Mueller, our water and cropping systems educator, Gage Selene Jefferson, uh, Jenny Reese, she's in York, Seward, and Hamilton. He's watching, I think, online. Aaron Nigren up at NREC in Saunders County. They all really helped me put this together and get it started, get it off the ground. They were instrumental in, in helping us pull it all together and get going again. So hopefully we can, we can grow this and we can make something useful for people some good information in a lot of topics and and uh, we have a good group of educators now in southeast Nebraska and I'll acknowledge Ratika Lama Shane she's in the southeast counties let's see if I can remember those Nemaha Johnson Richardson Pawnee so um, we've we've all been focused on getting together as a group and, and working together on some programs. So there's a, there's a lot of power now, I think, in this Southeast group from what I can tell. So I really appreciate them chipping in on this and we're, I think we're lucky in extension to have a lot of good people now. So without further ado, we'll get started with Brad Lubin. Associate Professor, Policy Specialist, Director of the North Central Extension Risk Management Education Center at UNL, the Department of Ag Econ, going to give us an update on the Farm Bill. John, thank you for the introduction, and first thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to join you. I didn't realize this was going to be the first session of the series, so uh, you have to start the first session with economics, I'm sorry. so and policy, no less. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll find something of value in that and some discussion of where we are and, and where we're going. Uh, Jeff Peterson, I know, is on uh, to talk after I'm done. Um, I uh, saw him on my way leaving campus because he teaches a uh, grain marketing class every morning at 8 o'clock. And uh, uh, so I waved to him and he waved to me as I was coming over here. So I look forward to seeing him shortly. Save all your real economic questions for Jeff, at least uh, as it relates to the market. Uh, I'm going to talk about policy, and I'm going to talk about uh, the development of a farm bill or the lack of development of a farm bill, as, it, as the case may be, and what that really means for producers at, at the present time. Uh, my, my title, as John introduced me, is long. I've got a few responsibilities, but uh, one of those is to try and address ag and public policy issues and federal farm legislation is certainly the sort of the paramount uh, piece that I try and follow from time to time. Some of my good colleagues and friends tell me that means I'm only relevant about once every five years, uh, but uh, 
uh, if all we do is extend the Farm Bill one year at a time, I am relevant every year, so how about that? Uh, that's where we are today. So I will reference as we get started too, this successful farming series here, uh, here in, in person in Lincoln at the moment and, and online to several other counties in the region. Uh, certainly an opportunity to, um, to, to gain knowledge and, and to put some information to work for your operations, for your clients, and so forth. Uh, I also want to point you to other sources of information, particularly cap.unl.edu. CAP stands for, not farm cap specifically, but Center for Agricultural Profitability. And uh, generally everything we're doing these days uh, from an ag econ, marketing, farm management, policy, uh, legal perspective, shows up on CAP. Uh, Center for Ag Profitability was established just over a couple years ago now, and, uh, uh, and you'll find everything there from uh, news releases and articles and analysis to weekly webinars and podcasts and other information up there as well. So I encourage you to follow that. There are many reports up there that are, that are quite... Uh, popular, quite valuable, our, our annual land report, um, our custom rates work, our uh, crop and livestock budget work as well. So uh, I'd point you to those for some information that may be helpful in your operations. With that, I want to talk about farm policy and specifically the Farm Bill. You do have some uh, handouts in front of you. They're, they're grayscale versions of these, and so I noticed that grayscale doesn't do justice to some charts very well. So. Uh, at least take note as we see some of the graphs here. Uh, I'll point out what I really mean in those graphs. But to set the stage, to talk about farm policy, specifically to talk about where we are with the Farm Bill and to talk about what that specifically means for 2024, I want to set the stage a little bit of what the Farm Bill is and why it's as complicated and why it's been as challenging as it is. And we know the Farm Bill is always sort of a product of its times. And economics of the times, the budget, the trade situation, uh, the political setting certainly matter. But first, it's economics. Every farm bill that I have followed since the 1980s, really, I can tell a story about it as a product of its times. Farm bills written for periods of good prices tend to have more flexibility and more reform and more market orientation. Farm bills written in periods of higher supplies and lower prices tend to focus on strengthening the safety net. What can we do? What can we change? How can we make it work better and stronger? And every farm bill up until now has really uh, sort of lived that uh, uh, sort of life cycle. The 2018 farm bill was written in a trough when prices were falling and farm incomes were falling. The 20, what was supposed to be the 2023 farm bill, arguably is sort of written in a new era of, well, it's post-pandemic, um, we've actually, in spite of the pandemic, had record farm income levels. We have record or, or near record prices, but we also have much higher production costs. We're walking on a much higher tightrope. And what kind of safety net do we need in that environment? What kind of changes to the safety net might we have? That's the economics of the day. But don't forget that the Farm Bill is more than just safety net. The safety net the producers often focus on is in the commodity program. It's in the crop insurance program. But if I gave you a quiz like I give my class on campus and I ask you where the money really is in that farm bill, one, two, three, four, nutrition. If you want to figure out where the money is and where the political battle really is in farm bill after farm bill, it's in the nutrition title. That's the food assistance portion of the farm bill, specifically the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. That is more than 80% of the total farm bill at present time. The first column is the cost or the estimated cost of the 2018 farm bill when it was passed. The second column is the uh, last May baseline of what the current farm bill would cost for the next 10 years. That's the baseline that we typically start with when we have a debate about you need to add money, you need to cut money, and so forth. It's about a $1.5 trillion farm bill today. And so we talk about it's a trillion plus farm bill. It's the first time it's been a trillion plus farm bill debate. Well, 1.2 trillion of that is the nutrition title. And look at the increase from the last bill to this bill. It's nearly doubled. There is more money in 
the growing nutrition title than there is in the rest of the Farm Bill put together. That's the changing dynamics that we've had, and that's the, that's the real food battle, food uh, fight that we've had in, in recent years. It's also politics. Depending upon who is chairing the agriculture committees, depending upon who's the ranking member, depending upon their interests, depending upon caucus uh, uh, preferences, what kind of battle do we have uh, and, and what kind of priorities rise to the top? Given where we're at, given the political setting, I can tell you the first answer. It's late. Uh, everybody knew it was going to be late, but it officially became late at the end of September. Uh, it's contentious. We're fighting over uh, food policy and food spending, and we've been fighting that fight over every single piece of legislation this year. We're not done yet. We did end up extending a farm bill. That means we're going to fight about it again in the coming year. Uh, there's also this fundamental imbalance, and I'll show it in a, in a bit, between baseline versus what we can call ad hoc. Baseline spending is what we know are in the programs that were authorized and specifically written to be there, like commodity programs, like separate legislation that authorizes crop insurance programs, like conservation, et cetera. Ad hoc are the billions upon billions of dollars that we have seen in recent years added for trade assistance and pandemic assistance and emergency relief and conservation spending, et cetera. Uh, substantial imbalance between what we typically plan on versus what we added uh, sort of on top. Well, how much of what we add on top sort of displaces the, the battle over what's in the baseline? Uh, the status quo outlook, if, if we we're making prognostications, uh, the, st the status quo reigns. The status quo says we're still fighting about provisions. It's hard to imagine getting to the finish line when we're still fighting about priorities. The consensus suggests, yes, we got an extension into 2024. That really only put the debate off another year, maybe less than a year given that 24 is also a election season, election year. Uh, so maybe we only have a few months in 2024 to really get something done. That's the sort of status of, of where we're at. These are the issues that I see that are really driving that debate. And all of them have some impact on what you're doing today and what we can look for in the coming year. Some of that is a battle over commodity programs and what kinds of program revisions, if any, are made in a new farm bill. Some of it's a battle over conservation programs and the amount of spending and the focus of that spending. Some of it is, some of it, an awful lot of it is a battle over nutrition assistance and how much money and how should it be spent and what requirements and so forth should be applied. And then there's a battle over the CCC, which is sort of an arcane little uh, component of farm policy called the Commodity Credit Corporation. It's also sort of the bank account from which USDA makes payments for farm programs. And the amount of money in that and the amount of authority or the amount of sort of discretion that the Secretary of Agriculture has to spend some of that money is, uh, is uh, at, at uh, question here as well. So I showed the uh, farm income situation nationally. Nebraska looks very similar with a slight hiccup in there. Record farm income in Nebraska in 20, uh, 2021. Record farm income nationally was set in 2022 before falling back this year. In Nebraska, 2022 fell. 2023 is expected to be a rebound. 2022 fell on drought losses, um, reduced production. Even at higher prices, reduced production fundamentally uh, took a whack out of farm income. 2023 looks like a rebound, which means we're re rebounding on yields. We're not where we want to be necessarily, but uh, rebounding and, and uh, uh, and a livestock sector that continues to, a cattle sector that fundamentally continues to uh, prop up farm income for now. That's just a local setting. It's still some very strong farm income numbers by any sort of historic calculation. The, the farm income situation affects the kind of farm bill debate you have. But this is a, a way to blend into a picture that says, yes, farm income's up. Oh, at the wrong button. Farm income's up. Receipts are way up. Crop receipts are up. Livestock receipts are up. Crop receipts have leveled off the last couple years with drought and, and now lower prices. 
livestock receipts are still shooting strongly higher, at least for the moment, on the strength of, of cattle. But if you add that up, let's see, there's about uh, 18 billion of livestock, there's about uh, 14 billion of crops, that gets you to 32. Well, <coughs> farm expenses are also way up. And basic intermediate farm expenses, labor interests and overhead, gets you up to about 27 or 28. 32 minus 27 gets you the roughly five to six uh, uh, farm income. We're closer to seven. This doesn't include like farm program payments minus property taxes, et cetera, et cetera, okay. Fundamentally, yes, receipts are up because prices are strong, but so are expenses, which means when prices were down here and expenses were here, you had a profit margin that was also protected by a safety net that kicked in around here. Prices are now up, expenses are up, here's your profit margin, the safety net's still down here. At least the commodity program safety net and the farm bill. That's the fundamental debate that says, what should we do to the safety net? Should we change how it works? Should we raise it? Should we try and improve the performance of it? If we do, that costs money. That's been the debate. Well, how do you write a new farm bill? Where do you find the money to make the changes that producers want to make, et cetera? In one graph, I'd like to tell the political story of that. Uh, we'll see how good I am at trying to do it in one graph. <clears throat> There's a fundamental debate across commodities, across regions, about ARC versus PLC, ag risk coverage, the revenue safety net, versus PLC price loss coverage, the, the, the price safety net. And that debate would fundamentally tell you that, well, corn and soybean producers have shifted towards ARC and they like the concept of revenue. The southern commodities, cotton, rice, and peanuts, absolutely not. They really like price. Wheat and grain sorghum sort of fall in the middle because they are Great Plains commodities that have both northern and southern uh, uh, constituencies. But if I told this story all the way back to 20, 2004, through about 2010, 11, and 12, and we were implementing a 2008 farm bill, and then what was supposed to be a 2012 farm bill that ultimately became a 2014 farm bill. We were talking about, well, prices are stronger. The old safety net just doesn't mean as much anymore. What we really have at risk is revenue, not price. We need to change how the safety net works. And it was corn and soybean producers that argued about the need for what we called ACRE in the 08 Farm Bill, and then ARC in what became the 2014 Farm Bill. And when they signed up in 2014, particularly corn and soybean producers overwhelmingly chose ARC versus PLC better than 90%. Well, this is a ratio of market prices versus safety net, price safety net. Back in 2005, everybody, 2004 or 5, everybody was down here where the safety net was roughly on par with prices, which meant that price protection was pretty strong on the downside. By 2008, 9, uh, into 11 and 12, Corn and soybean prices and sorghum as well, we're up in the neighborhood of two and a half times the safety net. Corn safety net was, I believe, 263. It was still 263 when corn was up at six bucks. Do you care about a safety net at 263 when you're up here? No, I want a different kind of safety net. ARC sounds pretty good because it's an average price and an average yield that translates into an average revenue. The less and less relevant the safety net looked, the more and more relevant alternatives like revenue looked. Corn and soybeans and sorghum, wheat to a lesser extent, and then here's cotton, rice, and peanuts that really never got that far above the old safety net. Cotton had to change how its program works so they didn't technically sign up in 2014 for commodity programs, but rice and peanuts overwhelmingly chose PLC. I don't mean just overwhelming, I mean like 99.9% .9 chose PLC. They like price, corn and soybeans like revenue, grain sorghum, wheat were a little bit in the middle. That was 2014. By the time we got to 2018, new farm bill, a new decision for producers in 2019 slash 2020, prices had all fallen to the point that the price safety net was suddenly relevant again. Uh, for all commodities. And when producers had a new decision, 
Corn producers overwhelmingly shifted from ARC to PLC. Soybean producers lean towards PLC, but not, not fully. Wheat, sorghum, cotton was back in the program, rice, peanuts, overwhelmingly PLC. Do they really care about the design or do they fundamentally care about the level of support? Now we've had this brief period for three or four or five years. That's enough to change the average, which drives up the ARC support level. It actually, as I'll show you for decisions for 24, also changes the, um, changes the PLC support level. So now we're gonna have producers in 2024 making decisions about where are we now and what kind of safety net do we want now. Now, I could tell you this chart explains why cotton and rice, or why, excuse me, why corn and soybean producers propose a shift towards ARC. I could also tell you this is why given these price levels, these price expectations, why producers of most commodities want higher uh, levels of, of support in the next farm bill. But that's fundamentally the, the story of where we've been and how we've got here. That's the commodity program. That's part of the commodity program. They were part of the safety net. That's the legislated support programs in Title I. If you look, however, at the amount of payments that the government has been making to producers, we have commodity program payments, which were the direct payments of the 96 Farm Bill through 2013. We have uh, dairy program payments. We have crop program payments like target prices and deficiency payments, countercyclical payments, and now ARC and, or rather, yeah, ARC and PLC payments. All of that focus on how the safety net works. The safety net hasn't been paying out very much at all in the past few years. Conservation programs are in there at about $4 billion a year, fairly steady. And then there's this. This box is supplemental and disaster programs. A few of those programs are authorized, permanently funded disaster assistance programs for livestock. Most of those programs are ad hoc congressional uh, decisions and occasionally USDA uh, ad hoc decisions. Trump administration's trade assistance payments uh, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, the, uh, the, the market facilitation program payments explicitly. Uh, the disaster assistance payments like WIP and WIP Plus, which has become ERP and ERP, uh, uh, ELRP as well and so on and so forth. There are more acronyms up there than one really wants to keep track of, frankly speaking. But it's been an overwhelming amount of support going out the door in an ad hoc way, not in a legislated safety net program way. That really challenges us to say, well, how, what should the safety net even look like if we haven't really utilized the safety net as the primary support for programs and for producers in the past few years? Let me shift gears to the conservation debate. And this is about funding right now. But if we look at where we've been over time, we're about a $4 billion uh, payments to producers. About half of that is the uh, CRP program. About the other half, a uh, little bit more, is generally what we call working lands programs. Uh, EQIP, CSP, et cetera. CRP itself doesn't look the same as it used to. Uh, CRP has been around since 1985. When it originally started, it was fundamentally about general enrollments, field scale enrollments, retiring cropland from production and putting it into conservation uses. Over the past couple decades now, we have seen growth in what we call the continuous enrollment. That's the stuff that doesn't have to compete uh, through a bidding process. It has a maximum bid for the type of, of property and a producer can sign up at any time. That continuous enrollment doesn't enroll whole fields, it enrolls partial fields. It targets specific practices and priorities. Wellhead protection, uh, um, stream buffers, uh, pollinator habitat, some very sort of specific priority practices. That has been growing uh, for most of the last two decades. It's leveled off somewhat actually in, in recent years, but fundamentally that's a component of the CRP that is much more environmentally designed than the traditional general enrollments. The general enrollments are going downhill rather quickly. One brand new category over the last five or six years 
uh, of particular note, the grasslands provision. Uh, Nebraska is a leading participant in the CRP grasslands program. The grasslands provision is a provision to use the CRP to make payments on grasslands that stay in production. They're not retired for conservation uses like the general enrollments or the, or the continuous. They're grassland that stays in production for grazing, for haying, but in a managed uh, way that's environmentally uh, um, sensitive or protective of, of the environmental benefits on that land as well. Grasslands have become nearly a third of the overall program at the present time and a real opportunity for, <coughs> excuse me, for producers, uh, for uh, uh, rangeland, grassland owners across the state. So when we think about conservation programming, even the old sort of stale 30-year-old CRP program, there's a relatively new component in there that's pretty attractive uh, to producers who have grass, who keep it in production. <clears throat> Most of the growth, however, as I noted, is not CRP. Most of the growth in recent years has been EQIP and CSP and other working lands programs. <clears throat> if you put all the numbers together in one time, the bottom is CRP, EQIP, C uh, CSP, uh, the blue is, is the regional or the ASEP, the Ag Conservation Easement Program. There's a bar in there for light blue for the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. It's, it's the whole portfolio. And that's grown in total spending from about $4 billion to about $6 billion a year. So $4 billion plus gets into the pockets of producers. There's another couple billion for everything from technical assistance to program administration, implementation, et cetera. But that's where projected spending is going forward in the baseline. Except for this. There's about $20 billion extra that was added as part of the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022. So one of those mega pieces of, of legislation amidst the COVID pandemic and the economic uh, uh, climate of the times and the political climate of the times was the Inflation Reduction Act. And it included 20 million, roughly, of additional dollars for conservation programs for climate-based practices. That was authorized over four years. That's effectively providing the authority uh, to make appropriations to spend money over about 10 years. And that's the estimated author, that's the authorization, that's the estimated spending bump that goes with it. If you've got a program, conservation program that spends about six billion a year, and suddenly you have an extra 20 billion to spend over 10 years, that's a very healthy bump in conservation spending. Except that this isn't permanent. This is a one-time authorization in the Inflation Reduction Act. And so part of the debate is, can USDA even spend that money that quickly? Can they get it all out the door, given the authority and the timeline that they have? Part of the debate is, all of that's supposed to go for a very specific practice, but it's also a one-time shot. What if it's reallocated to existing programs and spread out so that it becomes part of the underlying program? It's a fight over where the dollars should be spent. It's a fight over how the dollars should be spent. Then we get the nutrition title. So there's a fight over commodities. There's a fight over conservation. There's most definitely a fight over nutrition. And if I put some numbers together to explain where we are on, on nutrition, I showed you the budget dollars earlier. We're a $1.2 trillion uh, nutrition program at the moment. Just the SNAP program. Uh, Growth in spending has been dramatic. SNAP is a supplemental nutrition program. It's a, it's a food assistance program for needy individuals. Presumably, it triggers up when economic conditions are down and need is greater. Theoretically, when economic conditions improve, it should trigger down uh, as well. Well, it triggers up and down. It triggers up back in the Great Recession. Notice it doesn't trigger down nearly as fast, it doesn't fall down nearly as fast as it triggers up, right? That's one of the realities that we've seen over recent years. It triggers up dramatically during the pandemic, and only now are we beginning to face some of the challenges of, well, do some of those temporary benefits fall off, and what happens to uh, projections over time? So there's a fundamental debate about how much is being spent. There's also a fundamental debate about how it's being spent. 
blue line is participation, and participation's actually not dramatically up uh, relative to the last decade. But the uh, light bars here are inflation adjusted spending. The benefits are substantially up. The benefits are up because of some temporary pandemic benefits, because of some uh, um, uh, adjustments in, in eligibility, expansion in temporary eligibility. The benefits are also up because of a substantial rewrite of the formula that determines uh, the size of the benefit, something that is called the thrifty food plan, more sort of arcane politics or jargon that, that uh, uh, happens in DC. The USDA has the authority of, um, and the responsibility by the Farm Bill to rewrite the thrifty food plan on a regular basis. When they rewrote that plan to effectively determine how much really needs to be spent to, to satisfy a, family food, uh, a family's need for food, the increased dollars that were spent on the revision are greater than the rest of the Farm Bill put together. I, I mentioned that earlier. The SNAP is bigger than the rest of the Farm Bill put together. The increase from one administrative readjustment is greater than the rest of the Farm Bill put together. That's the fight that we're having at the moment. So part of the fight is how much spending? What kind of benefit levels do we see? What kind of requirements should we have in terms of eligibility or length or, or participation requirements? That's sort of the fight from the right. How much are we spending and why are we spending this much and how can we rein it back in? I could also show you charts that said, well, is SNAP spending about a temporary response to the economic conditions? Well then theoretically SNAP goes up during recessions because unemployment goes up and the need goes up. And SNAP should come back down during economic growth periods. It goes up, it doesn't seem to come down nearly as fast. And yet it's not tracking unemployment nearly as closely as it's tracking poverty. If you take a poverty calculation and the percent of families living in poverty, it looks like SNAP is a much better reflection of that than it is a reflection of current economic climate, which suggests that this isn't really a temporary assistance program to people in need and transition. This is more of a permanent safety net for the working poor, uh, for those that are struggling through poverty. That's the that's the numbers there. The last graph would show it's also about the hungry. Well, the poor are the hungry, uh, often cases here, but it's about uh, programs that, that help uh, with the poor. It's about programs that alleviate food insecurity. Food insecurity is trickling up this past year in 2022, not down. Part of that is, well, Food price inflation has taken a real bite out of the budget, and that certainly hurts. Part of that is some of those temporary pandemic era uh, benefits are expiring, and that hurts. So food insecurity is up. Poverty rates ha have uh, trickled back up during the pandemic uh, and the recession. Uh, how do you have a debate about how much money we should spend in a time of increasing need? That's the fight over nutrition. Uh, that is not a fight I have an answer for, but that's the fight that we fought early this year when we battled over the debt ceiling, and we ended up with a compromise of some sort. And instead of declaring victory and moving on, we fought the very same fight in the House Ag Appropriations process. And that Ag Appropriations bill ended up dying on the floor of Congress, only to be sort of extended with a continuing resolution, which means we have until January to fight that fight again. And if we solve that fight somewhere in appropriations, I can almost rest assured it will be fought again in the Farm Bill proper. So we will continually have this fight before us. It's a Farm Bill, yeah, but the single biggest fight is about this. And it's gonna be a challenge that doesn't go away. One more issue before I finish with some discussion of, of sort of the, the current state of affairs and decisions. I mentioned this earlier and I already showed the slide of spending, but the fundamental big issue about this sort of ad hoc and emergency spending going on, ad hoc means it's not part of the sort of standard set of programs, it's done on an ad hoc basis. Much of that is congressionally authorized. 
Some of it is simply implemented by the discretion or with the discretion of the Secretary of Agriculture. The Trump administration implemented trade assistance out of uh, secretarial discretion. Uh, the Biden administration has implemented climate smart payments out of the CCC funds with secretarial uh, discretion. So there's the 20 billion plus of conservation spending. There's $3 billion of awards made for climate smart practices that came from the secretary's uh, discretionary use of CCC. So it's a battle over CCC for two reasons. One, for practical purposes, neither party trusts the administration of the other party with how they spend that money. It's a really big bank account, and neither party really has faith that the other party can do it right. And so we typically see arguments about trying to rein in the authority when it's the administration of another party. <clears throat> Two, if that budget for CCC is now approaching $3 billion a year, well, if we rein in the authority, that's $3 billion that we don't spend, which means we have $3 billion to spend somewhere else. That's how the budget economics work. So in a fight over what a farm bill should look like, part of the fight is, Maybe this is a bank account that we can rob. There's only so many big bank accounts. Commodity programs, conservation programs, food and nutrition assistance programs, and the CCC, and crop insurance, although crop insurance technically doesn't rely on a farm bill. There's only so many big bank accounts, and uh, if you're looking for money to make changes, you'd find creative ways to try and uh, uh, shift those bank accounts around. That's the farm bill debate. That's the setting, that's the issues, that's the challenges we have. That's why we ended up extending a farm bill because we never got around to solving those issues, let alone finding four time to actually have a real debate. That's why it is still fundamentally a challenge going into 2024. Ultimately, we now have a focus on let's pass a 2024 farm bill. But the challenges are still there, the timeline is, is tight. In the meantime, we have the immediate sort of uh, issues above us. We have 2023 crops that are now harvested, or almost nearly so. We still have until next fall for the marketing year to finish, which means we have until next October before any sort of support payments on the 23 crop show up. And we have 2024 enrollment decisions ahead of us now. If they, are, if they happen in regular time, that's March 15th. If they don't happen in regular time because the extension didn't happen in regular time, we may have a few more weeks uh, to do that. But fundamentally, those are the decisions ahead. First off, a look back sort of at 2023. If you recognize these are the, where the reference prices kicked in for the PLC program, these were the benchmark prices for the ARC program. If this is the projected National marketing year average price, which I mentioned earlier, I'm not, the, I'm not the price expert, so I don't have any reason to uh, believe or doubt those estimates. But Jeff is already here, and Jeff's the market expert, so he will tell you whether those are right or not. But anyway, these are the national marketing year prices that would impact farm program payments. And these are the current estimates, at least published by uh, USDA's World Ag Outlook Board. Uh, they were the current estimates when I put the chart together. That was August. They've adjusted a bit since then. <clears throat> if that kind of price level is where we end up for the season average compared to a 370 reference price, we obviously have no PLC payment. And at the prices we're at, we're not going to have PLC payments for the major crops. We would have to have something like a 25% price loss uh, or a 35% price loss in beans to imagine getting down to where PLC mattered. So if you enrolled in PLC, cash flow is zero, or at least expected cash flow is zero. If you enrolled in ARC, well, the ARC benchmark, or the ARC safety net, if you'll recall, the ARC benchmark is a five-year Olympic average yield times a five-year Olympic average price, times 86% gives you the guarantee. If revenue falls below 86%, you end up with ARC payments, Based on this benchmark price, based on benchmark yields that are a five-year trend-adjusted average, 
you would have to have uh, about a 31% uh, uh, revenue drop from current prices and trend yields in order to trigger ARC payments. 25% in sorghum, 36% in beans, 35% in wheat. That's substantial. I dare say some producers face those big yield drops because of drought conditions. But it's not the producer yields that matter unless you're in the ARC individual coverage program. If you're in the ARC county program, it has to be a county yield that drops that far. There are adjustments. There's both an irrigated yield and a non-irrigated yield. So, um, so each practice matters. But fundamentally, it would have to be a very sizable drop in yield at the county level to trigger ARC payments if those prices in fact hold. Um, I suspect there will be ARC payments in Nebraska. I don't think they'll be widespread, even amidst drought. Last year's drought was substantially deeper in many parts of the state, uh, and ARC payments were still relatively limited across the state. So that's 2023, sort of in hindsight, but again, cash flow is coming up uh, uh, later this year, later in 2024. So I leave you with some discussion of decisions for 2024. And I first talk about corn. And this is a busy chart, but there's a reason to get to it. Market price projections in, uh, market prices in the black line projections over the next five years uh, here uh, to go out according to some uh, analysis we did earlier this fall. Again, no faith in those except to say, you know, projections generally show we're coming off the highs and the best you can do at long run projections is to assume we're approaching long run average. If you don't assume more shocks, if you don't assume more surprises, uh, if you don't assume dramatic changes in, in, in demand, we're returning to long run averages. The red line here is what was originally a target price that became a reference price. Uh, that reference price is at 370. When corn's up here in the six to seven range or even in the four to five range, 370 doesn't matter. And that's why we don't have any uh, PLC payments on the horizon. There is a formula in the 2018 Farm Bill that says if market prices are high enough long enough, then the five-year Olympic average moves higher and PLC will move higher accordingly. This is the five-year Olympic average. This is 85% of the five-year Olympic average. When this number gets higher than the 370 legislated price, the reference price goes up. For the first time in 2024, that number's higher, which means the reference price in 2024 for corn will be 401, not 370. Woo woo, yeah. Uh, there's still a lot of risk between where we're at now and 401, but it's 31 cents better than uh, what it would have been last year. Okay. That's corn. That's PLC. In ARC, we have, we still have this underlying reference price, but ARC, we have a benchmark uh, price tied to the five-year Olympic average price. Five-year Olympic average yield times five-year Olympic average price times 86%. On this graph, I take the five-year Olympic average price times 86%. That's where I conveniently say ARC kicks in at this price if you hit benchmark yields, if you hit Olympic average trend-adjusted yields. In 2014, when we first chose it, that strongly looked uh, strongly beat out PLC, and that's why 90 plus percent of producers corn chose ARC. When lower prices kick in, the guarantee falls, and suddenly you're down at levels where the effective protection in ARC uh, looks poor compared to the effective protection in PLC, and they overwhelmingly chose PLC. Now we're back to a level where this year PLC will kick in at 401, and ARC effectively kicks in at 408. It's actually a real decision. It's not simple. That was simple. This was simple. This is not simple. Uh, it may take some real economics to decide which one really provides you better protection. They still work very differently, but 
it's a close enough decision that it's worth some real analysis. That's corn. If I try and eliminate the clutter, effectively you're comparing the red line for PLC versus the dashed line for where ARC effectively kicks in. And at least for uh, 2024 and 25, 26, 27, we're actually at levels where this might be a real contest. That's corn. Soybeans. Prices again, reference price goes up this year because of uh, the five-year Olympic average uh, kicking it up. But compared to where ARC is at, ARC was strongly uh, uh, favored over PLC, 95 plus percent in 2014 chose ARC. Come 2019, 2020, I would have said, well, the ARC protection is less than the PLC protection. We still had better than half, maybe two thirds still chose ARC. Of note, prices moved around, prices never actually dipped to a point that PLC kicked in. So maybe it's not just which, how strong is the protection part of it is, uh, well, if PLC has never kicked in, my memory is that PLC doesn't work. And so we stayed with ARC. Now we're over here trying to compare what looks like very, very similar safety net levels. Wheat, just for reference, the, the ARC protection is climbing, the, um, the price protection is climbing, but for 2024, it still looks like PLC, frankly. Looked like it looked an awful lot like PLC then. It certainly looked like PLC then. It might still look like PLC now. Okay. One more table to finish that up. If this is the effective reference price for 2024, corn is higher, sorghum is higher, soybeans are higher, wheat's actually not. Congratulations, wheat has never rallied far enough to actually kick up the reference price yet. If we keep it going next year, yes, but not, not this year. This is where the effective ARC price kicks in. Again, 408 versus 401. That's a pretty close contest. 937 versus 926, that's a really close contest. If I move over here, this is the projected price at the moment. What kind of price change would it take from current projections to trigger? What kind of revenue change would it take from current projected price and benchmark yields to trigger? You have about the same downside risk in either case. So ARC versus PLC for 2024 specifically, one year decision, is actually a pretty difficult, challenging decision. We're doing some analysis that, uh, uh, with some research uh, efforts on campus uh, we're studying some of the impacts of these kinds of programs on what we call case farms. And that will help us illustrate a bit how these programs actually turn into financial results on the farms. But fundamentally, it's worth noting uh, that it's, uh, the, the decision's relatively close. I have this chart up here just to remind you, this is the projected price for 2024. If we fall down here, or rather 2023 in this case, fall down here to 495. How much confidence do you have in my projections? I would assume none. How much confidence do you have in Jeff? A whole lot more than me. Um, but how confident can we be about these projections? Uh, this black line is where prices have moved over time. All of these lines, those are the long run projections that we have made from USDA or the Congressional Budget Office or FAPRI, the research center. Uh, over the various time periods. When we're at $2 corn, we predict 2 to 250 and we get surprised. When we're at $4 corn, we predict $4 corn, and we get surprised. When we're at $7 corn, we know that won't last, so maybe it's going to fall to 5 or, and we're surprised. All this tells me is wherever we're at, we're going to be surprised. It tells me economists are very good Economists are very good at drawing straight lines. Wherever you're at, we assume that we're going to trend back towards some long run average. In reality, we're going to shock our way around it. So part of it is the safety net can protect you from those shocks. 
making the right choice on safety net is actually more complex than it's been, and we really can't tell you which one to choose because we really can't tell you what direction we're really going to go. So I leave you with this. What do we really have before us here for 2024? In March, we would have an enrollment decision between ARC and PLC. That should be March 15th. That would be the same date as the March 15th crop insurance deadline. Since the extension happened late, FSA can't, couldn't gear up that quickly. Enrollment would already be underway in a normal year right now. But the extension didn't happen until uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Enrollment can't get started in time. The chances that it ends on time seems remote. <clears throat> in March, we should also have a new baseline from CBO, which matters for the Farm Bill debate because if I said we're fighting about making commodity program changes and we're fighting about conservation spending and we're fighting about nutrition spending and we're fighting about CCC, in March, CBO will issue an updated estimate of what those things cost. And we're fighting over dollars that might not even be there in the next baseline. Or we're fighting over changes in commodity programs that might be more expensive by the time we get, they get scored under a, new, uh, under a new budget outlook. So that matters. That should be coming in March. In September, again, the farm bill's due. This time it's supposed to be the 2024 farm bill uh, that's due in September. Uh, we'll see if it gets done in time. But don't forget, there's a general election which means there's primaries already starting in, in, July, in January, primaries and caucuses. There's uh, a general campaign that starts midsummer. If we don't get a farm bill done by midsummer, it's hard to imagine we're gonna get it done in the fall. It occasionally happens that we don't get it done and then we come back in the lame duck session and get it done before the end of the year, um, but if you really expect progress on the new farm bill, somehow it's got to happen in roughly the next six months. And so we'll see how that plays out. If we don't, then we get to talk about December 31 again and what we call the dairy cliff or the milk cliff because programs that expire uh, and basically shut off at the end of the crop year and revert to permanent legislation, which none of us really know how to work. Uh, so that's the... That's the hammer that ensures we actually do get something done. There's a chance we get a new farm bill done. There's a chance we do it in the first half of the year. There's a chance we come back and do it in lame duck. Or the fail safe is, nope, we need to figure out another extension and extend it into 2025 so that we can have a new Congress take over and start the debate. So that's the outlook ahead. Hopefully there's a little bit of information there to use this year uh, in the meantime. I'll leave it at that and be happy to steal any of Jeff's time to take questions, I guess. What quarter will we decide our PLC? It's uh, perhaps. Yeah, I will restate it, you bet. Uh, very, good, very good question. What, what should we do about ARC and PLC? Flip a quarter. Now, it's not, it's not quite that, but um, it matters in, in 14 there was a clear economic sort of preference. In 1920, arguably, there was a clear economic preference. Now they're close enough that I can't tell you that either one really expects to pay more, but remember, PLC protects price all the way down to the loan rate. ARC protects revenue, so it protects more than price, but it only protects it for the first 10% because presumably an individual's crop insurance does a better job down here. Which which range of risk really matters more is the, is the good question. If I've got a really good marketing plan, do I need to double up on both hedging and PLC payments? Producers have a history of doing that, but do I need that? Or am I better off at, with a revenue plan that sort of protects the portion that I don't have a good insurance coverage on? That's, that's the debate. It's also not quite that clear, PLC versus ARC. I, do you have any producers, does anybody here in the room, or does any, do you have any clients that are using uh, SCO or ECO, the supplemental coverage option? 
Nobody's, nobody's buying up above that. So you buy individual crop insurance yield or revenue plans up to as high as 85%. There's a supplemental coverage option, a county-based plan that covers from 86 down to whatever you buy. And then there's an enhanced coverage option that covers from 90 or 95 down to 86. Anybody can also purchase ECO, but you can only purchase SCO if you're not enrolled in the ARC program. Because SCO and ARC kind of look like they cover the same thing. County level based coverage tied to a revenue band that's in the 86% down to. So if you're a fan of SCO, then you sign up for PCL, PLC because you also want to buy SCO. It comes at a cost, so maybe you don't want to buy SCO. But it's also subsidized, like other crop insurance, so the expected return on it's typically better than the cost. So maybe you do. So I just made it more difficult. <laughs> you need two or three coins. If you're really a fan of SCO, it would seem that the analysis favors PLC. If you're not a fan of or not a buyer of SCO because you're already insuring up to 85% anyway, then maybe the analysis favors ARC. So, right, so in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 an acre. Um, so it's not the 100 plus CRP dollar payments, um, but in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 an acre for pasture that qualifies that, that you implement a, a management plan that's, uh, that protects the resources. Maybe there's limited grazing, not necessarily no grazing, but limited grazing during a nesting season or those kinds of practices. Um, uh, but effectively a modest payment, but something. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, yes, I think so. Um, it's, it's not, it, it allows for grazing, allows for haying and grazing, so presumably that's more than just rangeland. It's also uh, also grass forage land. But um, those are all questions that go to the FSA office. Yeah, it's 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 relatively new, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was, um, at one time briefly, there was something called the Grassland Reserve Program, which came in, and it's not the CRP, it's the GRP, and it was make payments for that kind of purpose. Um, or it would offer an easement to keep it in grass. Basically, keep it in grass and not convert it to crops. Um, the easement portion goes to the easement programs. The sort of rental portion now finds its way into CRP. So that's where it, that's sort of the genesis of it. But, um, but if you can manage, if, if you can accept the management plan that goes with it, um, it might change the stocking rate. You know, it might uh, um, on not on forages, but on on rangeland, obviously. Um, but if you can manage the the, if you can accept the management restrictions that come with it, it might look pretty attractive. All right, thank you for the time. I do appreciate the chance to come out and speak to both the crowd here and, and the crowd online. Uh, and I uh, always look forward to any, any questions or any follow-up you may have. So, John, thank you very much. Yeah, let's give Brad a hand. We're lucky to, here in Lancaster, we have a lot of brain power right down the road. So we can pull these guys out of the classroom and teach us. And, here, Brad, here's your parting gift for coming over and joining us. <laughs> yeah, as, as crops educators, we 
we can get too focused on production and recommending practices that make sense in the field. But policy and marketing is so powerful in how we make our decisions. So that's really good for me to hear to hear the economist speak. And I hope it's I hope it's also good for you. Um, so we have a sponsor today, um, Chris Scow with with U Farm. He's also on our Lancaster Extension Board, and we're going to give him a minute to talk about what they do, and then we'll take a little break before Jeff speaks. Thank you, John, and uh, I'll step over here to yeah, get where Jim can see everybody online. So <clears throat> thank you, and uh, welcome this morning um, on behalf of uh, the Extension Office here and uh, once again, and, and uh, on behalf of UFARM, um, and to those of you online that are watching. Uh, as John said, uh, my name is Chris Scow. Uh, I'm with a company here in, based in Lincoln. Uh, we are across the state called United Farm and Ranch Management. We use the acronym UFARM. It's a lot shorter to say. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, myself and Gerald Clausen, one of our uh, attendees in the audience, we're both on the extension board here in Lancaster County and uh, just completing my, my sixth year here on the board. And so glad to see this program come back. Um, I think it'll continue to grow again. We had really good participation um, when Tyler left and kind of things really got rolling and we missed it for a little while. And so uh, we're happy to, to sponsor this initial session and get things started again. But uh, um, just a little bit, I, I see familiar faces in the room that probably know who we are and what we do, but um, we manage uh, agricultural real estate across Nebraska and some of the surrounding states, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, South Dakota as well. And uh, we have four locations in, um, in Nebraska. Lincoln is our home office, Northport, Kearney, North Platte. And then we have an additional office in, in Columbia, Missouri. And uh, we do some work in Missouri and Kansas uh, out of that location as well. And so I travel down there, work with our individual um, in Missouri and Kansas on some things. Uh, we've got some rangeland in Kansas. So we're looking at maybe doing some grassland CRP. We've done a little bit of that out of our North Platte office. It is relatively new, but it is something worth looking into because we've found it be, to be beneficial um, out in the western part of the state and some of the things we're doing with some rangeland out there. So I have with me today Dan Tylen. Um, Dan is one of our farm managers in our Lincoln office um, that covers basically Highway 77 west to Highway 81 down to the Kansas border. Um, and probably you get into Butler County up that direction as well, north and west. And our other gentleman in Lincoln travels from Lincoln basically over to the Missouri River and down toward Falls City in that direction. And, and then We've got 15 employees in the company, um, basically nine farm managers in the business, and managing today about 90,000 acres, roughly. Um, and uh, we do, besides the farm management side, we do real estate sales, um, private treaty, traditional listings, as well as um, live and online and simulcast auctions. Um, the online auction thing started up here when the pandemic uh, hit, and we couldn't get everybody in a room to, to sell land. and so. Um, the online thing is kind of, I think it's one of the things like I, I say Zoom meetings and maybe online auctions are going to continue after the pandemic. Um, one thing we kind of learned that that works fairly well. And uh, But the simulcast is a nice blend. You, you do a live auction so you can come to a location and bid um, live or you can be online as well. But uh, again, we we'll, won't take any more of your time here this morning, but we appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, enjoy the rest of this morning. Thanks. <laughs> 